So I'd like to introduce the speaker for uh, the first speaker of today's session, Robert Speckens, who is talking about disentangling influence and inference in quantum and classical theories. And I understand that uh, Rob, if you have any questions, you can put something on the chat or I guess people can just speak, right? Can I ask yeah. a question? Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. Uh, during the talk. Okay, thank you very much. Great. Um, so thanks for the introduction and thanks uh, to the organizers for uh, giving me a chance to talk to you today. Um, so I'm going to be talking about some uh, joint work uh, in collaboration with John Selby, who was a postdoctoral fellow at Perma Institute, and is now at the University of Gdansk, uh, and my PhD student, uh, David Schmidt. Uh, so I'm a, a theoretical physicist, uh, not a category theorist. Uh, a lot of the expertise in category theory for this talk was provided uh, by John Subley, but I, I hope uh, I understand it well enough to be able to answer your questions. Um, it's, the talk is going to be about um, sort of a, a long-standing, uh, well, it's a recent project, but a sort of long-standing desire to do a better job of uh, disentangling notions of causal influence and uh, inference in both classical theories and, and quantum theory. And so I want to start the talk by telling you about uh, some of the motivations for achieving such uh, a disentangling. Uh, so my uh, main area of work is the foundations of quantum theory. Um, and so one of my favorite quotes is by E.T. James, a physicist. Um, and uh, maybe I, I won't read the quote out, but he's basically complaining about how uh, quantum theory as it's presented uh, in, in the textbooks and how it was origi originally devised is, is this peculiar mixture describing in part realities of nature, in part incomplete human information about nature, all scrambled up by Heisenberg and Bohr into an omelet that nobody has seen how to unscramble. Um, yet we think that the unscrambling is a prerequisite for any further advance in basic physical theory, for if we cannot separate the subjective and objective aspects of the formalism, we cannot know what we are talking about. It's just that simple. And so I, I really uh, believe that, endorse that sentiment. I think it's uh, critical to disentangle, you know, uh, what it is in the formalism that's talking about reality and what in the formalism is talking merely about our information about reality. Um, and so, uh, you know, for, for many years, I've, I've worked on a research program that essentially tries to do that for the, the quantum formalism. Uh, and in recent years, uh, I've become persuaded that, that the perhaps the most constructive way of thinking about what the realities of nature are in uh, theories would be in terms of the um, causal structure of those theories, the, the causal relations among systems. Uh, and the incomplete human information is, a, is about inference. Um, and so I'll say a bit more uh, what I mean by that, but that's eff effectively the, the particular aspects of ontology and epistemology that I'll be talking about today, causation versus uh, inference. Okay, um, so let me give you an example of how uh, you know, these things uh, can be separated somewhat and uh, how we should discuss them in the context of one of the uh, experiments in the foundations of quantum theory that gets perhaps the most attention, that's Bell's experiment. So I uh, depicted it up here. So you have a, a device that generates two particles uh, in an entangled state and they go off to measurement devices. And each measurement device has a setting variable, you know, S and T, which tells you, you know, what you're measuring, and then some outcome, you know, here denoted by these light bulbs, and, and there's some variable X and some variable Y that describes the outcomes of these two measurements. And then uh, what you get by running the experiment many times is uh, statistics. And so for each of the, excuse me, four possible um, joint settings on the two sides, uh, and each of the four possible outcomes, you get probabilities uh, for, for log ones. And, and so the question is how uh, to explain, you know, these, th this is the sort of thing that quantum theory predicts for a particular choice of these measurements in this entangled state. Uh, and we want to explain that. And so uh, in, in the approach I'm describing, what we want is a causal explanation. And so we want to answer questions such as, uh, is it the case that the setting variable on the left wing over here uh, influences the particle, say, on, on the right? And that's why we're getting correlations between, you know, the X and Y outcomes in this experiment. Or is it just that we're seeing these correlations because there's a common cause uh, acting on A and B? These, these are differing causal explanations of what's going on. 
uh, and uh, the claim is that it, it really matters uh, what, uh, what the underlying causal structure is uh, in this experiment. Uh, so if we look at each of these in turn, uh, so I would say this is the conservative causal hypothesis, the, the common cause. It certainly matches uh, what you sort of see in the, the, the makeup of the experiment. Uh, but the problem is, and this was really uh, uh, John Bell's genius, he, he was able to show that if you assume that this is the causal structure and you assume that your inferences, so for example, you know, when you learn the outcome X on the left-hand side and you try to make inferences about what the outcome Y should be, um, if you use classical probability theory to uh, make your inferences, uh, you see that the kinds of correlations you uh, expect and the kinds of inferences you expect uh, to be able to make uh, don't match the statistical correlations I just uh, showed you in that table, the, the ones predicted by quantum theory. So you derive some uh, inequalities that hold for this sort of causal structure together with an assumption of classical probability theory, and then show that quantum theory violates those inequalities. So it, it looks like this conservative causal hypothesis doesn't work for achieving a causal explanation. And so that's led many people to, to take the more radical causal hypothesis that maybe the setting on the left can influence uh, the degrees of freedom on the right. Um, but this also has problems because you can do this experiment in such a way that the two wings uh, are uh, space-like separated so that even if influences propagate uh, at uh, the speed of light, you know, the choice of setting over here cannot influence the outcome on the other side. And um, so, so these sorts of influences uh, would have to violate relativity theory. They would have to go uh, faster than the speed of light. Uh, and so that seems awkward. And furthermore, uh, there's an argument that shows that even if you believe that relativity theory only restricts, uh, for example, the speed at which you can send signals rather than just the speed of causal influences, uh, this is still an awkward explanation because ultimately there is a causal pathway from the setting on the left to the outcome on the right. And yet we always see that they're uncorrelated. Um, there's no possibility of, of signaling. So the outcomes on one end uh, don't have any statistical correlation to the setting on the other. And so the only way to achieve that independence in this sort of causal diagram is if you choose the parameters of your causal model in a fine-tuned way so that they manage to wash out any of these correlations. And that's also a very uh, awkward and undesirable kind of, of causal explanation. So it seems like bo both of the reasonable options uh, uh, don't work and you can show that you sort of have uh, the, the same problems with really any causal structure you might uh, want to lay down. Okay, so um, sorry, I have a question. Are you assuming that in each of these causal structures you're specifically using classical state spaces and classical evolution like stochastic maps or something like that? Or are you allowing your systems to actually be quantum systems with quantum dynamics? So the, the calculation of the statistics in that data table, I'm, I'm presuming that that's done using quantum theory. And then here we're asking about the potential for explaining those statistics in terms of an underlying causal model. And that causal model, I'm presuming that every variable is uh, specified in terms of its causal parents uh, using some stochastic map, right? So that's, that's exactly what Bell and others have assumed. It's like, is there a uh, underlying physical explanation of what's going on? And the rules of the game are is that you use classical probability theory to reason about the common cause, the unobserved common cause. Um, yeah, you'll see in a moment that I'm going to, I want to argue that, that we, we should deviate from that. Uh, but that's right, yeah. Any other questions? Okay, so, so the idea is that it, uh, we should still seek to provide a, a causal explanation because that's what sort of getting at the underlying reality is about. Um, and, and what I uh, favor in terms of, you know, how to make sense of this is that uh, we should seek an interpretation of quantum theory that's causally conservative, uh, but is radical in the theory of inference that it uses. So the way that we should ought to, ought to update our beliefs uh, in the presence of sort of unobserved uh, systems is not classical probability theory, but uh, an innovation of classical probability theory. Uh, so that's the idea. So I'm gonna give you sort of just a, a brief sketch to give you a flavor for uh, how that might work. Uh, and then the rest of the talk I'm gonna by the end of the talk, I'm going to tell you a little bit about where I think uh, the, the research program should go. Uh, but this is just to give you the, the flavor. So suppose I've, I've assumed that the Bell experiment has this causal structure here. Uh, and then 
uh, if I learn, you know, uh, uh, on the left what the setting and the outcome are, I update my beliefs about the distance system B. And so in quantum theory, there's, there's an algorithm for doing that. There's some density operator assigned to, to system B. Uh, and if I learn the outcome over here, I, I generally update that. That's sort of the, the, the quantum state update rule from a distance that Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen described. And so I want to think of that as a kind of Bayesian updating that, you know, the quantum state of B, think of it as describing your uh, incomplete information about the system B. And then when you condition on these variables, you, you've got some new state of information uh, about B. That's, that's how, I, how we want to conceive. That's the only way you can make sense of this update of B if you've assumed that it's a common cause, right? Like learning something about here can update your information, but it's not influencing what's happening over there. So let's ask ourselves, how do we do that if B were in fact a classical variable? So then my, my knowledge of B would just be some distribution, P of B over here. And I would want to update it to P of B given S and X. And of course, to do that, uh, I need uh, to use uh, various aspects of the formalism of classical probability theory. So uh, in this problem, what we're given would be some joint distribution over A and B. And then the measurement on A, which is some conditional of X given A and giving the set, setting variable S. So then I just use the, the standard tools of, of the Bayesian calculus. I would start by doing a Bayesian inversion. I would say, what has X and S taught me about A? So I compute the conditional A given S X in terms of what's given the X given A S and, uh, and the joint, which allows me to compute the marginal. I would then ask, well, what does uh, A teach me about B? And I can compute that from the joint and the marginal. And then finally, I would take what S and X teach me about A and what A teaches me about B to compute what S and X teach me about B. And that, that would be what I update my knowledge to. Um, so, so the idea is that if we want to interpret the quantum formalism as being a theory of inference, we need to have all the same sorts of uh, uh, steps. We need to be able to do all of this. And so in this uh, paper with Matt Liefer, we, you know, we proposed a way to try to do this. Um, so you know, in this case, the given would be the joint state over A and B. Uh, you're also given a measurement on A, which uh, in our approach we write as an operator. So this is an operator that's isomorphic to the map from A and S to X. Uh, but it's an operator on the tensor product of X and S and A's uh, Hilbert spaces. Um, and we set out uh, analogs of all these things. So, you know, this is the kind of, this is what they look like uh, where you have a kind of pseudo inverse on your operators. You have this star uh, operator product here, which is both non-commutative and non-associative. But, you know, all the, all the equations look somewhat analogous to the classical ones. Um, the marginalization here becomes just a, a trace operation. Um, so this, this formalism, you know, wor works for this kind of example, uh, but in general, it, it doesn't really uh, solve all the problems. So if you, uh, if you, you look at the original paper, we described various problems, and in this uh, follow-up paper, we, we found more. And this is not the, the solution. This is not how uh, one ought to do quantum Bayesian inference for an arbitrary causal scenario. Uh, but I hope it kind of gives you the flavor of, of what we're looking for. We want a way of interpreting or extracting from the quantum formalism something uh, that is uh, like a theory of inference, uh, but uh, more general, and that can reproduce the sorts of predictions, uh, the sorts of calculations we do in quantum theory. Okay, um, so if you're, gonna, if, if you're interested in this sort of project, then it, it definitely helps to have a kind of synthetic approach to theories of inference. Uh, so I think we're, we're going to hear talks about that in this conference. So this, this nice paper by uh, uh, Tobias that, that came out recently that describes uh, Markov categories and uh, provides an opportunity for potentially quantum generalizations of inference. Uh, there's older work by Cho and Jacobs that I would characterize uh, similarly. Uh, and I have a, a paper myself with Bob Kuka where, you know, uh, way back we essentially tried to uh, cast this uh, theory that Liefer and I proposed together with classical probability theory sort of in, into a, a common category theory, theoretic framework. Um, but I would say that this, this, we had a limited success uh, at doing that. Um, my perspective these days is that, uh, you know, what, what went wrong with this, this older work was that there was some preparatory work, some further kind of unscrambling of the omelet that needed to be done first, that we weren't working with uh, quite the right uh, quantum formalism. And so this talk is really, trying to tell you about that, that preparatory work, that, that further uh, unscrambling that needs to be done. Uh, but ho hopefully it's sort of clear what, what the motivation is. Now there's, there's 
the, the formalism I'm going to tell you about the framework has various other motivations. In fact, our, our primary motivation was, you know, as we developed it was, was quite different. Uh, but I'm not going to go into some of these. Let me just mention. Um, so in the foundations of quantum theory, people study operational theories. Uh, some of the jargon is a generalized probabilistic theories. It's a way of talking about alternatives to quantum theory, for example. And something called ontological models of operational theories, which are like, uh, for instance, hidden variable models of quantum mechanics. Um, and so we were looking at trying to disentangle causation and inference in, in those sorts of frameworks. And in particular, we wanted a categorical formalization of a, a notion of classicality uh, termed generalized non-contextuality. Um, so much of uh, what we developed was, was motivated by this problem and it, it worked quite well at solving this problem. But uh, for this audience, I thought it'd be more interesting uh, to talk just about uh, cl classical theories and ultimately uh, how that might uh, help us with uh, understanding quantum theory. Okay, and then a, a final motivation it comes from the field of causal inference. So uh, this is a, a subfield of machine learning where people try to infer causal structure from observed correlations or estimate causal effects. Uh, and it turns out that the framework that they use generically also to some extent scrambles influence and inference, although much less than, than we see in quantum theory. And I'll, I'll give an example of this uh, near the end of the talk. It's, it's another place where you can apply uh, the framework that we've developed. Okay, so uh, before getting started, let me just uh, set out a, a few assumptions that are gonna be generic for what I'm talking about. So in, in causal inference, people usually use these directed acyclic graphs to describe causal structures. I've already flashed a few, one of them up for the, the, the Bell scenario. Uh, but in this talk, it's gonna be more useful to use st string diagrams instead. So, you know, the conversion is, is pretty straightforward. All the nodes in your DAG become wires in your string diagram. Uh, if I have a, a collection of arrows going into some node, that's just a, a gate whose inputs are all the parents of that node. So in this case, S and, and Z. And uh, if I have some node that has many arrows going out of it, well, then I just copy uh, that variable and send a copy to each of the, the gates that, that needs it. So this is how I'm gonna depict causal structures for, for the rest of the talk. Um, uh, in this talk, the, all the probabilities, wherever probabilities appear in either classical or quantum context, they're gonna be interpreted as uh, describing subjective degrees of belief. They're gonna be about inference, never about reality. Uh, so the, re the reality is gonna be deterministic. Uh, and all the systems from, from here on in to, uh, to the very end are, are gonna be classical. So there's not gonna be any quantum for most of the talk. And uh, uh, in, in this project, we've assumed all the variables are discrete. Uh, so there's, there's no continuum here. Okay, so let me uh, get down to the business of telling you something about the framework. Uh, so we're trying to disentangle causation and inference, and uh, the main tool we're going to use is uh, process theories, or uh, in other words, strict symmetric monoidal categories. Um, and uh, so, you know, here, here are the processes, uh, and you know, these are the, the systems. Uh, the, so the objects are systems, the morphisms are, are processes, uh, and we're going to make use of uh, many different uh, diagram preserving maps. So uh, we're going to denote that just by coloring the background. Uh, and then the property of diagram preservation uh, can be articulated just as the fact that if I first uh, apply the map to the processes and then I compose like this, uh, it's the same thing as if I compose them and then apply the map to the composed process. So we'll have a few different diagram preserving maps that show up. Okay, so um, to, to disentangle the, the causal and the inferential aspects uh, in a framework, uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start by sort of describing each of the two components, the causal and the, the inferential components. And then we're gonna put them together into the framework. So let's start with uh, the causal component. Uh, so we're gonna define a causal process theory and call it uh, cause for the sake of this talk as follows. So it's, it's gonna encode a hypothesis about the underlying causal structure. So you've got uh, your, your objects, your systems, uh, which are causal mediaries, uh, and you've got some causal mechanisms with certain uh, inputs uh, and outputs. Um, so uh, for, for our purposes, all of these systems are just gonna be finite sets. The causal mechanisms are all gonna be functions. So this is really just the symmetric mono category of, of uh, functions on, on finite sets. Um, so it's, 
deterministic uh, causal influences. That's uh, what we're assuming here. Uh, so that's pretty simple. The, the inferential theory is the one that's uh, more involved. So the inferential theory has, has two components. The, the first component is just Bayesian probability theory, which are, we're going to denote as uh, Bayes. Um, and so to distinguish it from, from the causal theory, uh, the, the causal theory had all of the wires running vertically. The inferential theory is going to have wires running uh, horizontally. So, so now the, the systems, they're, they're still finite sets, but they're thought of as, as really you know, uh, what I'm talking about, what I have knowledge of. Um, and the uh, processes are going to be uh, things like, you know, uh, the state-like processes are just probability distributions, uh, the generic processes are stochastic maps, and uh, uh, terminal processes like this one just correspond to marginalization uh, in, in the Bayesian probability theory. So this is just uh, the symmetric monoidal category of stochastic maps on, on finite sets. All right. Uh, the second component of the inferential theory, uh, which we were sort of pushed at some point to include, uh, is about propositional logic. Um, so we're going to call that Boole. Um, and so the idea is that uh, on these uh, systems, the, these finite sets, uh, we can encode propositions as yes-no questions. So uh, a, 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 such a question will be, you know, modeled by a function from the finite set to uh, the Boolean set, which we're just going to think of as, you know, the, the, the set of answers, yes or no, to that question. And uh, we denote it this way. Um, so now you, you can easily represent logical operations on your proposition. So if I'm interested in you know, the proposition, which is the, the disjunction of pi or pi prime, well, uh, all I have to do is uh, copy my system x, uh, consider the, prop, the, the question associated with pi on the first copy, the question associated with pi prime on the second, and then take the disjunction of the Booleans that are the answers to those questions, where this uh, disjunction operation is just given by the regular uh, truth table uh, for disjunction. And similarly, I could consider the, the negation of a proposition to just be the proposition followed by uh, the not uh, on, on the Boolean system. Uh, so I can, you know, define all the usual sorts of uh, logical connectives in terms of the, the disjunction and the not operation. Uh, I can uh, formalize Boolean algebra homomorphisms by having, you know, if I have any function from y to x preceding some uh, yes, no question associated with the proposition, well, that just defines some new proposition. If this proposition picks out a subset of x as, uh, you know, the, the values for which uh, that uh, the answer to this yes, no question is yes, uh, then this function just, you know, picks out some subset of y and defines a yes, no question on, on y. Um, and uh, it's not hard to show that, uh, you know, all of these functions preserve uh, the, the logical structure. So, for example, it preserves the, the disjunction. I can just rewrite my disjunction in this way, and then uh, this function propagates through the, the copy operation. So now it's just the disjunction of f acting on pi and f acting on, on pi prime. Um, in this uh, Boolean uh, process theory, we also can talk about the value assignments to a variable. So this denotes uh, assigning the value little x to the variable x. Um, and these value assignments allow us to assign answers to these propositional questions. So for example, uh, if this uh, question here corresponds to a, a proposition that picks out some subset of uh, the, the set X, then if little X is in that subset for which the answer is yes, then this returns the, uh, the guess state on the Boolean, otherwise it returns no. Okay, um, and now finally, the, uh, we're gonna introduce uh, new effects in, in Boole uh, that are associated with partial functions. Okay, so, uh, so now that, that this needn't be, def this is not necessarily defined on the, the full uh, domain. And so every uh, proposition can now be associated with one of these uh, terminal processes, these, these effects. And, and the idea is uh, that if, if we define truth values as scalars in, in Boole, so these are also going to be partial functions, you know, the true scalar just maps the singleton to itself and the false scalar is just uh, undefined on the singleton. Uh, if, if we do this, then we can um, uh, e easily, you know, introduce 
effects, these, these Boolean effects, which just uh, pick out whether you know, the, the Boolean is, is yes or no. So yeah, if I look at this scalar as true, this scalar is false. And so in, in particular, um, I can define the propositional effect associated with some question just by adding on the, the yes effect on the end. So this is the, uh, the effect that uh, basically stipulates that the answer to this question is, is yes. Um, okay, so are, now, yes. Uh, are your morphisms now relations instead of functions? That's right, yeah, they're, they're, they're partial functions. Okay. But you Thank you. That's right. Um, okay, so, so now finally you could say, well, if I have a, a value assignment of little x to x, uh, then if I evaluate a propositional effect on that, uh, it just gives me a truth value assignment to that, that proposition. So, you know, this scalar is going to be either true or false, and it just tells me whether you know, th this proposition always sort of picks out some subset of x, and if little x is in that subset, then it evaluates to true. So this just provides a way of talking uh, about logic. And so now this, our full theory of inference just combines together this Bayesian component and this Boolean propositional logic. Um, so if you ask, well, what are the, the most general things you can do by combining them together? Well, first of all, everything in Bayes and Boole uh, you can show is, can be represented by uh, substochastic matrices. So they're both inside uh, the process theory of substochastic matrices acting on finite sets. And it turns out that any substochastic matrix can be realized in this way using this kind of diagram where I copy X, I apply elements from the Bayes theory and I, uh, uh, apply one of these propositional uh, effects here on, on one of them. And it's not difficult to show that you can get any substochastic matrix in this way. And so our theory of inference really just corresponds to the process theory of substochastic maps uh, on, on finite sets. Uh, and it's quite nice. You can show things like, uh, you know, the, these deterministic functions, which were, you know, Boolean algebra homomorphisms uh, when considered as part of Boole, those are just, uh, you know, deterministic stochastic maps in, in this larger theory. They, they have an interpretation in either Bayes or Boole. Or similarly, like marginalization is like, uh, is, is uh, equivalent to just the propositional effect, which asks whether a variable has any of its possible values, right? It's the, the trivial propositional effect. So it's, it's quite a nice, uh, you know, uh, process theory, and uh, in particular, the diagrammatic calculus we have for the, the propositional logic seems quite nice. Um, we wonder whether this has all, you know, been done before or whether there's some related work. So if anyone knows of something like this out there in the literature, we'd, we'd be uh, keen to hear about it. Okay, uh, so let me now combine the causal and the inferential parts together uh, into a single framework. So we're going to call the, the combined thing CI. That's our causal inferential process theory. Uh, and so there's going to be these diagram preserving maps that embed uh, the causal and the inferential process theories within uh, the causal inferential theory. So the systems, uh, these, these vertical and horizontal wires, the ones in cause and, and inf, are again going to be uh, systems in the causal inferential theory. Uh, there's going to be this diagram preserving map, this uh, green map here uh, called I. Uh, which basically says that if S is some stochastic uh, or substochastic map in the inferential theory, uh, there's a corresponding map in the causal inferential theory. And there's going to be a map that takes uh, causal processes, like say some function T from A to B, into the causal inferential theory. Uh, I'll explain this notation in a moment, but it basically maps it into uh, knowing that the function is definitely T uh, in a way that I'll explain. Okay, so, so let me talk a bit about uh, how these two uh, kinds of systems uh, interact. So there's three uh, generators and, and rewrite rules associated to these that define the interactions between systems that have come from cause and systems from, from inf. Um, so uh, here's how it's going to work. So the first interaction is really uh, stipulating sort of what we know about uh, functional dynamics uh, so, so if I have some causal mechanism that transforms A into B, there's, there's many possibilities for that function. So denote the set of possibilities as A arrow B with this bar on top. And so now uh, for each pair of systems A and B, uh, I can have this kind of interaction, which is a way of talking about what I know about the function that takes A to B. Right? That's what this horizontal wire allows me to talk about. So I can specify a particular state of knowledge I might have about the function that relates A to B. Uh, so it could be some distribution sigma here. Uh, 
Um, are you yes. describing the objects of your category CI right now? I'm describing, yeah, the, the, uh, we have these uh, interactions, right? So the, the, the uh, vertical wires are describing essentially, you know, systems that are entering into causal relations with one another. The horizontal wires are describing, you know, systems that we can have knowledge about and express propositions about. And now we're talking about how they interact. Okay. Thanks. Um, so there's some pretty uh, obvious consistency conditions on, on this first interaction. So uh, let me go through this one. Uh, if, if I have uh, the possibility for some knowledge of the function that relates A to B and the function that relates B to C, then that'll correspond to a particular type of knowledge of the function that relates A to C. So there's some uh, a, a map here. Uh, which is defined such that if I know, for example, that the function from A to B is T, and I know that the function from, from B to C is T prime, then I necessarily know that the overall function is just the composition of T and T prime. So this is a way of expressing in the inferential theory uh, the sequential composition relation that exists in the causal theory. So my, my knowledge should, should track that. Um, you know, my beliefs should be uh, consistent with how those functions compose. And you can write down a similar uh, uh, consistency condition for parallel composition of functions rather than serial compositions. Uh, I won't go through that. And then uh, you similarly, if you know, for instance, that uh, the function is identity, we can just denote that as the, the wire, or if you know that it's a swap operation, then you can just denote that as uh, wires being swapped. The second interaction is uh, concerns what you can learn about a, a causal system. Uh, so for each uh, system X, uh, we have an interaction now with wires that come out towards the right. And that represents learning something about uh, the value of that uh, variable X. And so, for example, I can ask propositional questions about some, some causal system X by just uh, you know, adding one of these propositional questions on, on one of these wires. And so again, we have consistency conditions like this one here, which says if I you know, learn something uh, about uh, this system x uh, twice has the same as learning uh, something once and then making a copy uh, where the copy operation is the thing that just uh, you know, any uh, point uh, it's any a value assignment just uh, factorizes and there's something similar for for parallel uh, composition and if i you know learn something and then marginalize over it ignore it uh, it's the same as not learning anything at all Okay, um, and then finally, the, uh, the third interaction, it corresponds to essentially ignoring a system. Uh, so we think of that as a, sort of an epistemic process, you know, deciding that you're not going to learn anything more about system A in the future. So we sort of, uh, it's a way of cutting it off. So this is, this is not, uh, you know, destroying A, that would be a causal process. This is deciding not to talk about A anymore. And it satisfies the obvious constraint that if I, you know, ignore the composite AB, that corresponds to ignoring A and ignoring B. Um, and uh, if I ignore the output of some function, uh, well, that corresponds to just uh, ignoring what function occurred and, and the input. So in other words, if I'm interested in some proposition about A, then it really doesn't matter what I know about the, the function that later was acted on A. You know, if I'm ultimately going to ignore the output, then, then it doesn't matter what I knew about the function. That just corresponds to you know, ignoring uh, the input. Okay, so this is just an interaction between our, our third and our, our first uh, uh, interaction, the rewrite rule involving both. Okay, so that, that, that tells you something about this uh, causal inferential theory. So now let me go back and, and uh, stipulate exactly what these uh, diagram preserving maps are. So this uh, E map is a way of taking a causal process and turning it into a, a state of knowledge in this uh, interacting theory, which says that I have the point distribution on the function t. That's my knowledge of what uh, function relates a to b. And, and you can easily check that this map is indeed uh, diagram preserving. I, I won't go through the proof, but it just uses uh, those uh, rewrite rules I just told you about. Um, as I said, you also have this I, which just embeds all uh, substochastic matrices into this. And then there's this other uh, partial map, now P, we call it the prediction map, uh, which takes uh, uh, certain objects in the causal inferential theory back to the uh, inferential theory. So uh, if I have some arbitrary diagram D, uh, but it only has inferential inputs and outputs, 
So no uh, open wires, uh, causal wires. Uh, then I can map it to some substochastic matrix in, in inf, and I can think of that as, uh, you know, supporting predictions. So if you give me a state of knowledge about this input here, I can use the map and to uh, infer what my state of knowledge of, of this output inferential system should be. And of course, if, if it had open causal wires, then this thing would just not be defined. And so that's the sense in which it's uh, only a partial map. Uh, it has to satisfy the following consistency condition, which if S is some substochastic matrix that came from inf, and I map it through I into my causal inferential theory, and then I map it back through P, it's got to be the same substochastic matrix that I started with. Okay, so that's that's basically all, all the components. Now let me uh, sort of show you some, some examples of how this works. You know, he, here's an example of a causal inferential diagram wherein you might know something about how, uh, you know, uh, know something about the, the system A initially, so that has some probability distribution over A. You can think of it as sort of the, the function from the singleton to, to A, so I know something about that function. And I know something about how A gets mapped to X. That's my state of knowledge tau. And then maybe I'm interested in some proposition about X. You know, it, does it take some range of values or not. Uh, and after that, I'm just gonna ignore the system. So, so this, uh, if I use my PMAP, can evaluate to some probability, which tells me the probability that this proposition is true given these states of knowledge. Uh, so you know, normally we would have written this as maybe some distribution and then I hit it with a conditional probability and I evaluate some indicator function on it. Uh, but the, the nice thing about this formalism, you can do more general things now. Like you could imagine having correlated knowledge of what the initialization of A was and of the function that acted on A. Uh, you couldn't easily do this with just a uh, conditional probability, so I could have correlated knowledge of what those are. And then I might want to, I might be interested in a proposition that relates not just to the, the value of X at the end, but you know, what that function was and, and what the initial value of A was, and maybe even some sort of random dice that has nothing to do with these systems at all. So all of those sorts of things can be uh, expressed in, in this framework. Um, uh, the, the final thing that I want to uh, mention uh, is uh, a notion of inferential equivalence that you can define here. So uh, we're going to say the two processes or two diagrams in the causal inferential theory are inferentially equivalent, if and only if they look the same from the perspective of the inferential theory. So um, we need to be able to map, therefore, uh, you know, diagrams from the causal inferential theory to objects in the inferential theory. And, and the way to do that is, is to just use uh, some other diagram, which we, we sometimes call a tester, which has only inferential inputs and outputs. So if I have some causal inputs and outputs in this diagram together with it, whatever internal structure it has, I, I need to seal them off and be left with something that has only these inferential inputs and outputs. And then I can map it. it once, once it's in the, that form, I can map it through this map P into something in the infer inferential theory. And so, uh, I can now define this notion of inferential equivalence uh, for two diagrams, D and E, if for all uh, possible testers, uh, I get the, the same uh, inferential object. So, th so the idea is that um, from the perspective of making inferences, uh, D and E are indistinguishable, right? All, all the inferences I can make from the input, the inferential input to the inferential output for D are the same as for E, no matter what tester uh, I put on. Let, let me make that a little bit more concrete by giving you a, a specific example. So imagine you have uh, a, a function on a system that's just binary, right? So the set is zero, one. Uh, there's only four functions uh, from uh, a binary variable to itself. There's the identity, there's the, the flip or the not function, uh, the one that's the constant function that always evaluates to zero and the one that just uh, resets the variable to one. Um, now I can have, you know, consider the following two states of knowledge about what that function is. So the first is equal likelihood that it's identity or flip. The second is equal likelihood that it's the reset to zero or the reset to one. These are different uh, objects in this causal inferential theory. They're, they're different states of knowledge. In fact, they have, you know, no overlap at all. The supports of these two distributions are, are completely disjoint. So these are clearly not equal states of knowledge. Uh, but if I ask, uh, are they the same for the purposes of the inference? The answer is yes. They, I, could, I cannot uh, distinguish them inferentially. So for instance, if I, if I, um, you know, I want to make inferences uh, about the output, let's call the output y and the input x. If I want to make inferences from x to y, then for these two states of knowledge about what the function is, 
the stochastic map is exactly the same. So in the first example, it's a mixture of identity and, and not. Uh, these, these are the stochastic matrices associated with those. The second example is it's a mi equal mixture of reset to zero, reset to one. And those both mix to the stochastic map that just randomizes the bit. It says whatever the input is, just generate a random output. And so for the purposes of, of inferences, these things look exactly the same. Okay, so that's in, you know, this is just an example of, of inferential uh, equivalence. Okay, so, so uh, I'll come back in a moment to you know, why, why that's pertinent to the, the program of developing a quantum theory of inference. Uh, but now that I've sort of set up all the formalism, I wanna show you uh, at least one example of, of something you can do with it in the field of causal inference. Um, well, okay, I'll say what, I'll, I'm sorry, I, I need to say one more thing before I, I did that, uh, which is just that this uh, equivalence relation that I just defined uh, preserves composition and so you can quotient by it. So in addition to this causal inferential theory, I can have a quotiented version of the causal inferential theory where I identify uh, diagrams that are inferentially equivalent uh, and I can have uh, analogs of all these uh, maps, I, I just, these, these maps E and I that I described before. Um, okay, uh, as I say, I'll, I'll come back to this in just a moment, but let me, let me give you uh, a taste for uh, what you can do for the field of causal inference. Uh, so as I said earlier, it's it, the, the framework that you, you uh, use in, in that field, I would say, although it tries very hard to distinguish causal and inferential claims, it's, it's not optimal for, for doing that. Uh, and so one example of that is that there's no, uh, even though they rely very heavy, heavily on, on diagrammatic techniques with these DAGs, there's no graphical way of proving uh, this result called the de-separation theorem and to prove generalization of the de-separation theorem. So uh, let me tell you a bit about what that theorem is and, and how our framework can help. So it's, it's really a theorem about how for a given causal structure, you can make inferences about what sorts of independences and conditional independences have to hold in any distribution that arises from that, that causal structure, that arises from a model with that structure. So take this example here, suppose, uh, U is a common effect of X and Y. So, so in our framework, that means there's some function F, which has U as an output and X and Y and maybe some other systems as an input. So this is a, what it looks like in the causal theory. So uh, in, in causal inference, uh, there's a rule that says, well, look, if you marginalize over U, uh, then X and Y become independent. And the idea is that if you, know, if you were to post-select on U, if you were to condition on the value of U, then, then it might be that X and Y become dependent, you know, learning something about X would teach you something about Y. So for example, if like U is just the and of binary X and binary Y, then you know, learning that U takes the value zero induces correlations between X and Y. But if you're marginalizing over U, that doesn't happen and, and they stay independent. So that's kind of written out in, in causal inference as sort of a specific rule. Whereas in our framework, it just follows from you know, the, the nature of uh, you know, the, the inferential theory. So, you know, what we do is we say, well, you, you start out uh, knowing something about uh, uh, maybe some initial knowledge of X and Y, some knowledge about the function that takes it to you, and now you marginalize over you. That's this uh, wire here. And then you apply our rewrite rules. And what you find is that uh, this thing topologically separates. And so if I map these diagrams in the causal inferential theory into my inferential theory, this thing here is just some probability distribution over X and Y. And this equality says that it factorizes. So it's X and Y are, are independent. Uh, here's a second example. Uh, if Z is the causal mediator between X and Y, then when I condition on Z, X and Y become independent. Uh, so, they're, so they're conditionally independent given Z. And the idea here is that although learning about X can teach you about Y, it only does that because it teaches you about Z, which teaches you about Y. And if you already know everything there is to know about Z, then learning X won't teach you anything new about Y. And so this is sort of encoded as, as, a, as a rule in, in the de-separation theorem, but here it just follows from uh, the, the graphical calculus, right? So we, we put in uh, that we've learnt that Z, uh, you know, that the truth of a proposition about Z, namely that it has the value of little Z. So this is, a, this is an atomic proposition. And we have rewrite rules that allow us to uh, basically you know, uh, show that this thing topologically separates so that when I map it into the inferential theory, the distribution on X and Y now uh, factorizes. This is a, an inferential equivalence. Um, these two diagrams are, are the same for the purposes of making inferences between X and Y. And then finally, maybe the, the kind of most common example of deseparation is 
when you've got like a fork where Z is a common cause of X and Y. So you can draw that this way. And it's the same thing. If you condition on Z, X and Y become independent and, and you have uh, rewrite rules that'll, that'll get you there. Okay, so I'm, I'm uh, gonna, uh, uh, well, actually, let me, let me skip this. Uh, I just wanted to say that in addition to everything that people do in causal inference, you, you can define new notions of conditional independence in this uh, graphical framework like uh, independence for a particular value of Z rather than for all values of Z uh, or independence, you know, regardless what you know about Z, not just if you condition or marginalize over it. And uh, finally, you have independence maybe uh, relativized to particular sets of parameters, like particular uh, states of knowledge about the functions or, or the, uh, the root variables. Um, okay. So uh, back, back to, uh, I want to sort of make the connection back to the quantum theory. So remember this example we had of this inferential equivalence of the two states of knowledge of the functions. Uh, what I want to emphasize here is that this implies that the, the quotient to theory loses information about causal structure. So if you notice that like, this state of knowledge is, is, uh, has support on cases where there's perfect causal influence from the input to the output, right? Both identity and flip. And if I, if I toggle the input, the output will toggle. So that's a perfect causal influence. Whereas the cases where I reset to zero, reset to one, there's no causal influence. I can toggle the input and nothing happens to the output. Um, and so these, these quotient theories, if I identify objects like this, I'm losing information about causal relations. I'm identifying something where there's a perfect causal influence with something where there's no causal influence. So if you're, you're interested in unscrambling the omelet, you don't want to work with the, the quotient theory. Um, you want to work with the unquotiented theory, this causal inferential theory down here, rather than this one. And so uh, if I think about quantum theory now, uh, so, so everything I've said is, is about these classical process theories, um, but the, the idea of this research program is that there should be a quantum equivalent of this, that, that uh, there ought to be a kind of quantum generalization of the causal theory, a quantum generalization of the inferential theory. Uh, they should interact together in one of these causal inferential theories. And there'll be some notion of, of quotienting uh, there as well. That things become inferential equivalent. And um, the, the key is that the usual quantum formalism has applied this quotienting. When you ask sort of what in the standard quantum formalism does a completely positive map correspond to, it really is an equivalence, an inferential equivalence class of, of objects. And so that's the sense in which the usual quantum formalism uh, involves a scrambling of causal and inferential concepts because it's it's applied that quotienting operation, and so the the, the sort of the the, uh, the the program is to say well let's let's go back and and think more about the the right way you know how can we extract from the quantum formalism uh, this sort of object rather than this one, and I, I see that I've run out of time so I'm, I'm not going to talk about my speculations about how to do that so I'm just going to uh, uh, flash those slides up and maybe we can talk about them in the questions. Uh, I'll just say that, you know, that the fact that they have to interact in a particular way uh, imposes constraints on, on what these could, could possibly be. Okay, with that, uh, let me uh, finish and uh, just say thanks for your attention. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, thank you very much, Rob. Does anyone have any questions? Uh, I had a question. Um, first of all, thanks for the talk. It was really nice. Um, and this could be either wrong or naive, but um, or obvious. But is it possible that the kind of horizontal uh, inferential direction is like has something to do with an enriching category? That it's like um, it's the state of knowledge about morphisms. Right, whereas the vertical is the morphisms themselves. Uh, I, I, I don't really know much about enriched categories, but... Uh, the idea yeah. is that somehow you, usually categories are enriched in sets and you talk about the set of morphisms and you can combine two morphisms. Um, the combination process of morphisms is taking place in the enriching category. Right. Uh, in general, you could say I have a vector space of morphisms or whatever, but the enriching category is talking about how we combine the morphisms, whereas the category itself that's being enriched is like the morphisms being where, where the combinations actually take place. 
So mm. it's just kind of, it's kind of uh, in a previous slide, I don't know if um, it's worth going back to it or not, but it just kind of, some of those pictures remind, or I, I mean, I've never seen them kind of come combined in this way, but. Um, it, it sounds. Yeah, like here, around this area. All right, let me go back a bit. Or maybe two more. Yeah, that yeah, sort of here. thing looked. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so so you it, answer, it, see on the, on the second diagram after yeah. the equality, um, it seems like you're tensoring two HOM sets and combining and then inserting that into the morphism spot, that square. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, something about that reminded me of enrichment. So it's, yeah, it sounds like it might be connected, but let me just be clear on something. The, the, in, in our case, this uh, process theory cause uh, has lots of equalities, which for example, you know, like, uh, if, if I have the T box followed by the T prime box, that's equal to just the, the T composed with T prime box. So that's an equality. And then that equality also gets represented in the inferential theory in, in, in this sort of uh, equality. So it's really about saying things like, you know, my, my knowledge is gonna have to track facts about the, the causal category, right? So like if right. the causal category has certain identities, then if I have, you know, knowledge that says, oh yeah, the, the, the map from A to B is T and the map from B to C is T prime, then I bet they also believe that the overall map from A to C is T composed with T prime. So it's, it's not as if this is the only place that this is encoded, it's really encoded in both um, to, to make sure that your knowledge kind of tracks the, the causal structure. And it sounded like what you were saying was that in an enriched category, you're encoding facts only in the, the enrichment and not in, in the original, uh, did I misunderstand what an enriched category is? Or? Um, it's probably worth taking offline because there's like a lot of back and forth that might need to happen. Right. But this diagram, both of those look like intriguing to me from that perspective. Um, although I can't say I completely understood the distinction you were just making. Okay, well, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm keen to hear more. Cool. Um, I have a small question. At the very end, you mentioned something about CP maps being like sort of a, a quotient of something. Mm -hmm. Can you just say intuitively what you meant by that? Like why um, should I think of CP maps as forgetting too much information? Well, uh, so the example I did give, which was a classical example of, you know, a, a mixture of identity and not uh, on the one hand and a mixture of reset to zero, reset to one. Well, you know, I could think of that as an example of CP maps because, you know, the CP maps could just be classical stochastic maps if, if I have, uh, you know, decoherence in, in the original and the final basis. So, so the point is that, they, you know, that those two CP maps, uh, sorry, that those two states of knowledge about, you know, what, what uh, let, let, me, let me do it a bit better. Let, let's say, I, I replace the identity, the not, the reset to zero, reset to one with, with just quantum operations that do exactly the same thing with a qubit input, a qubit output. Then, then those two different states of knowledge about the, the quantum uh, operation will be described by the same CP map, right? That, that the, the randomizing stochastic matrix in the quantum form just becomes uh, a CP map which describes that randomization. And so the point is that the CP map is like the stochastic map it has already erased the information about a distribution of things. And so it is the quotiented object. You know, so it is the analog of, of just the stochastic matrices without the probability distribution over functions. And, and so I was complaining that, you know, if you only work with those stochastic matrices, you've lost some of the causal information. And therefore, if you only work with CP maps, you, you've also lost the causal information. And so that's ultimately why, you know, retrospectively, I would say my, my early attempts to to make sense of, of quantum theory as, as a sort of disentangling of causation and inference uh, were kind of doomed to fail because they were working with this formalism that has already done the quotienting. Um, and we really need to, to get below that. Thank you. Any, any other questions? Might have time for another quickie. Yeah, maybe uh, briefly. So, so this is really nice. Um, am I understanding correctly that you consider the two categories, cost and inf, as sort of the building blocks, the pieces out of which you build the, the category CI? Uh, 
but but the CI is really the one that that you would work with in in, in practice. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. All right. Well, maybe we can thank Rob again for your talk. It was really nice. I don't think. <laughs> and maybe we can swap over to the next speaker. Thank you.